mother, yours or mine, this isn't my time. Don't push me. She went ahead anyway, telling the servants, do whatever he tells you to do. Six stoneware water pots were there, used by the Jews for ritual washing. Each held 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus ordered the servants, fill the pots with water. And they filled them to the brim. Now fill your pitchers and take them to the host, Jesus said, and they did. When the host tasted the water that had become wine, he didn't know what had just happened, but the servants, of course, knew. He called out to the bridegroom. Everybody I know begins with the finest wine, and after the guests have had their fill, brings in the cheap stuff. But you've saved the best until now. This act in Cana of Galilee was the first sign Jesus gave, the first glimpse of his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is God's word for us, God's people. Thanks be to God. Wedding season will soon be here. But this passage isn't saying it's okay to get drunk at weddings, even though it's right there in the Bible. <laughs> Gospel writer John tells a story to show us some of the meaning behind some of the surprising things that Jesus says and does. This story of changing water into wine in John's Gospel is considered Jesus' first miracle. But there's a challenge because this story is only found in John's Gospel. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus' first miracle is the healing of a leper. And in Matthew and Luke's Gospel, it's the healing of a man with an unclean spirit. So we're not sure what Jesus' first miracle was. Maybe John lined it up this way to say this was the launching of Jesus' ministry. Because in this story, Jesus says, it's not my time. And yet, it turns out it was his time to do something miraculous. This story happens in Cana, which is a little podunk town down the bottom of the hill from Nazareth. If you walk down the hill from Nazareth, you get to Cana. If you go through there today, there's one blinking light and a lot of little shops on the side of the road that say, get your Cana wine here. <laughs> That's marketing, right? This is the only story Cana has in the Bible, so they make the most of it. Cana is a small, insignificant place. Not the kind of place I'd launch my ministry if I were Jesus. If I were going to start a big ministry like Jesus' ministry, I'd go to Jerusalem, which was the New York City of that area. Yet, Jesus' ministry begins here. I see what happens at the wedding in Cana and think, if Jesus can turn all that water into wine, he must be really powerful. So I better pay attention to this powerful influencer and his content. To do that is likely to miss the point. Gospel writer John doesn't seem all that impressed with the miracle. God can do amazing things. So to change water into wine is no big deal for God's Son. What the miracles that Jesus does tell us, their timing, their details, who's in them, what happens, the miracles really tell us something about who God is in Jesus and who we are. So why launch your ministry turning water into wine? Even Jesus seems to be a little confused about this. When Mary says, they're just about out of wine, Jesus says, is that any of our business, Mother, yours or mine? This isn't my time. Don't push me. Biblical scholars have done a lot of writing about what Jesus says to Mary here because it sounds kind of disrespectful. Instead of just saying, well, what does that have to do with me? Jesus basically says, chill, woman. <laughs> It sounds like he's annoyed with his mom. Are we missing something in the translation? It's hard to imagine Jesus being disrespectful to his mother. Let's think about this for a minute. Mary's driving this train, and this isn't her first rodeo with God. This woman has conversed with angels. Remember her visit from Gabriel? 
She was shamed because she became pregnant with Jesus before she was married. This is a woman who gave birth to a Messiah in a barn. A woman who went into exile when her son's life was threatened. Remember that story? Herod wanted to make sure that there were no kings competing with him. So when the wise men came and said, we've come to see the king of the Jews, Herod said, there are no other kings but me. Kill all the male children, newborn to two years old. That'll take care of that. So Jesus and his family went into exile. Mary's got cred. So if she says it's time to start your ministry, you might want to pay attention to her. But that day, Jesus told his mother, this isn't my time. Instead of arguing with him, Mary turned to the servants and said, do whatever he tells you. Jesus is standing there with his disciples going, I just told her I'm not doing anything. Mary goes right over his head. She turns to the wedding workers and says, just do what he tells you to do. And Jesus does what any good son does. He does what his mother tells him. He turns to the servants and says, fill the jars with water and take it to the chief steward. Those water jars are for purification, for Jewish ritual. There are six stone jars holding 30 gallons each. If they're filled up, that's about 180 gallons of water. That's no small task for the servants to go get that much water from the well and bring it back to the jars. So you know the servants were walking back and forth to the well, talking to each other. He knows they're out of wine, not water, right? This is weird. We might be wondering, why would Jesus fill up those water pots with water? If you can do the miracle, why not just skip the water and put wine right into the pots? You don't really need all that water, do you? Or is there a message to the miracle? Jesus fills the 180 gallons for whatever reason. And my clergy colleague, Dr. Steve Eason said, Here's where the miracle might just be more than the miracle. Everyday water is turned into extraordinary wine. What is that saying about who Jesus is and who he'll be in his ministry? And why God came to us in Christ? What about this? What if our lives are those empty pots? Don't you know people for whom the wine is run out? It happens in marriages. It happens for young people. It happens for older people. It happens for folks in between. We lose the joy, the celebration in life. We lose the party. Maybe this story is not about wine after all. Maybe it's about you and me and the world we live in today. What if God came in Christ to bring all of humanity abundant life, the very best wine? Maybe Mary's saying, this is where you started, Jesus, here in Podunk, Cana. Not in New York City, not in Times Square, not with a big old splash. Because one Pentecost Sunday, a preacher in Sacramento, California is going to take this story and tell it. Why? Because this story is about us. I've had the wine run out, and I'm guessing that you have too. And when it happens, you have to keep on going. So what you do is substitute the wine with other stuff. And you just put stuff in your jar hoping that you'll get through it. All the while knowing it's not the real thing. It's fake. And Mary's saying, Jesus, this happens to people all the time. This isn't about the wedding. They don't even mention the bride's name or her family who didn't 
by enough for the party. No, this story is bigger than the historical event of a wedding. Jesus takes what is ordinary, which is me and you, and changes it to something extraordinary by filling it with his spirit. Mary seemed to know this before Jesus. Mary gets it. She knows this is precisely the kind of miracle that will define who Jesus is in a world in which the wine often runs out. Jesus is the Messiah who replenishes life. You keep the party going, Jesus, she tells him. You restore joy and life in us. And when, a few years later, after the wine had run out for him, and his time was up, Jesus poured out his life for us. And after three days, God raised him from the dead. And Jesus spent 40 days meeting with people and teaching them about God and reminding them where to get a refill when the wine ran out in their lives. Pentecost is the birthday of the church. But it's not about doing more good deeds or going to more committee meetings. It's about drinking in more of the wine that Jesus provides in life. We don't have to just do it. We receive it. But for people like us, sometimes receiving is hard because we're doing We'll do whatever it takes to avoid admitting, I've run out, there's nothing left in the tank or the water jar. It's hard for us to admit that we're running on fumes, that we need something. But God's ready to give it. With God's gift of the Holy Spirit, we don't earn it, we don't achieve it, we just drink it in, we breathe it in. It's a gift. I wonder if the church has gotten too sober. Not 12 steps sober, but spiritually. Are we pretty dried up? The world can look at us and see a rather serious group that seems to be all about buildings and meetings, about rules and regs. When Jesus started his ministry with a glass of wine and a party, have we turned a relationship with God into a religion with rules? Don't you think the world would rather come to a celebration with a glass of something refreshing than to a party that's run dry? Oh, I think Mary knew that a long time before we did. And that's why she was waiting and praying in that upper room 10 days after Jesus went back to God. When Jesus sent the Spirit, and everyone ran outside yakking about how great God was. And folks in the crowd outside thought they were just being rowdy, that they were drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning. No, it was just Jesus being the life of the party, pouring out the wine of the Holy Spirit, so everyone could drink deeply of God's love. Full disclosure. We should know that doesn't mean a happily ever after ending. In the story of Acts, after Jesus' followers received the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, things didn't work out so great for them. There were imprisonments and shipwrecks, persecution, and lots of suffering. Yet, they had something that ran deep. They had hope. They had spirit. They knew that no matter what, the story wasn't finished yet. Over 2,000 years later, the story's still not finished. Jesus still offers to revive us and revive our hope, to fill us up with his spirit, to comfort and heal and change the world through us. As Christians, we base our hope not on our own power, 
not on the Dow Jones, not on our multifaceted skill set, but on the God who brings more when the wine has run out. Our hope doesn't rest in the things we can see, in the things that don't last. We hope in what's not seen, in spirit, and in the never-ending love of God from whom we come and to whom we return. Ash Wednesday to Easter to Pentecost, first breath 